Thanks everyone for joining. Hayden, thank you so much for, for being here. I know you're super busy and it's like a, a especially busy time right now at Uniswap Labs. Um, so much appreciated. I'm going to start, I guess, um, br brief intro on Hayden. I don't think he really needs much of an introduction. Everyone here probably knows him as the founder of Uniswap Labs and, and also the uh, creator of the Uniswap protocol. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Labs was started in 2018. The protocol is one of the most used, if not the most used in all of crypto um, at the application layer. Before being in crypto, you, I think we're working at Siemens in sort of like a telecom kind of engineering role. Um, and, and the origin story of, of Uniswap itself is also interesting. So I thought maybe we, we could start there about, you know, sort of your journey into crypto. What were you doing before and how did you, how did you get into the space in the first place? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, in college, I studied mechanical engineering and the first year after college, I worked at Siemens basically doing, uh, it wasn't, wasn't telecom, it was actually computational fluid dynamics, uh, but basically studying heat flow and doing heat flow simulations for car designs, which maybe sounds interesting and exciting, but it was actually incredibly boring. Well, working computational fluid dynamics, I'd say that I was probably not the best employee. I think maybe actually a starting point was I didn't really enjoy it. It was pretty boring, um, even though it doesn't sound it and just like wasn't very excited and, you know, fortunately got laid off about a year out of college and my first job. And I was like looking for something to do. And I had a friend uh, from college, Carl, who is currently the CTO at Optimism. But at the time, he had been working at the Ethereum Foundation and doing proof of uh, stake research. And we'd been friends for a while. And he just like was obsessed with Ethereum and convinced me that, you know, Ethereum was this really interesting, cool new technology that was going to be a thing and would be like, you know, the future of how finance and the internet worked, uh, or at least could be. And that it was kind of like that, like no one knew how to do smart contract development at the time, that it was like a really early niche skill. And so I decided to learn how to you know, write smart contracts on Ethereum as like a way to, you know, change careers, to, to try and learn something new and to, to be a part of this Ethereum thing. And so I spent, you know, a few months learning how to, how to write solid, basic solidity smart contracts. I had learned like tiny amounts of code as part of mechanical engineering, but really like MATLAB and like, like very basic stuff. Um, didn't have like, a full background. Uh, but, you know, my, just after learning like the basics of smart contracts, I really just felt like I was like stalling in my ability to learn more. And again, had like another call with Carl and this, he was again, kind of like, well, the thing you need to do is you need to take on a side project. You need to actually try to build something. You can't really learn just like, you know, watching YouTube videos and, and experimenting on your own. And so really, you know, uh, was looking for a project to start on and had a bunch of different ideas, but ultimately you know, settled on, on this blog post that Vitalik had written about like a new way to do exchange on Ethereum. And I thought it was really interesting to me. Ethereum was really cool and interesting because, you know, of this idea of you could build applications that no one controlled, that anyone could use, that you, that you didn't need to trust anyone uh, because you, all you needed to do was trust the code. And so that, the earliest idea of Uniswap was just, can you make a, a, you know, a smart contract on Ethereum that lets you trade between cryptocurrencies? in a way that it really embodies those properties of Ethereum, um, like true decentralization. And so decided to build a side project. Um, story will, will accelerate how quickly there, but uh, really just from there, spent the next year building out from like an early proof of concept, got a grant. You know, once I got the grant, it felt more real. And I just like took that proof of concept, kept building on it. Um, during that time, I started going to a lot of Ethereum conferences. So while building Uniswap sort of as a side project, just went to all the crypto Ethereum conferences I could. Just made like a lot of friends in space. The early Ethereum community was really cool and interesting. And everyone was building at the time. This was, you know, post 2017 bull market. This was like crazy bear market vibes. And it was just like the people who were still working on Ethereum really cared about it and were really interested in it. Um, it was like a really good community. And, uh, you know, spent all the grant money on smart contract security auditors and on contractors to write designs for the, for the web app and then launched it as a solo you know, project in November, 2018, uh, Uniswap Labs actually did not form until spring 2019 when, uh, so, you know, after people started to use V1 in the early days, it got that initial excitement and traction, uh, and, and then basically formed the company at that point. Yeah. Cool. I, I want to highlight one thing you mentioned, which is the, the dynamics of the market as an overlay to the origin story of, of Uniswap. So like the, I think the timing is really worth 
dwelling on for for a second longer here, given sort of where we are in, in crypto right now, where we're similarly in in you know the depths of uh, a bear market where um, folks outside of crypto are, are are sort of pronouncing it dead. And you know, um, I, I wonder if you could maybe just expand on that just a little bit. Um, you know, your your perception of crypto post twenty seventeen bubble and sort of the the dynamics at play, like in in the community during that time that you were getting off the ground. Yeah, I'd say that like, you know, ETH had fallen from like 1400 to like $80. Uh, I'm not a big like price person, but uh, generally it was like a lot of despair. And I think that at the time there was like no, a lot of the 20, the 27 hype was built on these like ICOs and everyone thought like ICOs, like there's like all these crazy projects, people are going to build really cool things. And then like some of the ICO projects did ultimately build cool things over many years, uh, but a lot of them also didn't. And a lot of like the hype was overpromised. And so I think that Uniswap was a little bit of like the anti-hype project where like other projects raised massive amounts of money and then promised a million, like the world and then delivered like, you know, really shitty UIs with like kind of smart contracts that often had like centralized backdoors and all that and um, had been like hyping themselves up for years. And then I'd say that Uniswap, when, at the moment of launch, most people hadn't heard of it yet. I had like, I announced it on my Twitter and I had like 150 followers at the time and you know, hadn't done any publicity around it really other than like going to conferences and talking to people in, in person. And so at the moment it launched, it has like, it had like a complete front end, a complete, you know, like the smart contracts were done and live and audited. The front end was done and live and you could use it and you could add a token and anyone could immediately, it was, so it was like immediately useful and usable and no one had heard of it before. And it kind of um, basically like contrasted really heavily against the projects at the time. Um, uh, and, and I think even like the fact that I didn't have a token at the time was like very, it was sort of like the anti-hype project where it was just like, oh, it works and it already exists and I can already use it. And then I think the other part where the bear market, but I think that was exciting to people is like, I think the other exciting part was that like having something that like was gaining, like people started to use it and the volume numbers started to like creep up. And it was the early usage was from projects that were like struggling to get listed on centralized exchanges um, or struggled to create, find market makers who would create liquidity in them. So they had very low liquidity on centralized exchanges. And so having this ability to like self-serve, uh, to list and create liquidity, um, in the, back then in the early days was, was really huge for a few projects. And so as you start to get these an early usage and adoption, having like a, a chart that was like going up, it, uh, even like the Uniswap usage chart was like the only like up chart at, at that point in time and everything else was like, was like down. And so like, it kind of like was like a rallying cry to point for like the early Ethereum community of like, here's something that actually like is working. People are using it. Um, it didn't overhype itself. And, and so that was where like a lot of this like, initial excitement and adoption and, 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 uh, and community like support came from. Totally. Yeah. I, re I remember that. And I think that is one major opportunity in bear markets. And like, if, if there's something that's growing in, in a bear market, you can, you know, you can, you can point to that and get the support of the whole community behind you because crypto needs wins under its belt. Um, so yeah, you mentioned like it was just you at the outset. Can you talk a little bit about the early team that you built out once the company was formed um, yeah. and sort of what, yeah, like if, if there was sort of any intentionality around like how you built out that team and, and what the focus was um, what, once you did? Yeah. And, and by just me, I mean, I was the only like full-time person. I'd say that like it was, there was, I had so much support and like, uh, you know, along the way, and there's a whole blog post on that. If you Google like a short history of Uniswap, but um once I formed the company in spring 2019, raised that initial seed round, the uh, the first two people that I hired, one was Noah. Uh, he, he was a you know smart contract engineer, had been working at another crypto project, uh, but really could do smart contract and back end, or sorry, and and, and front end and back end, kind of like full stack of, of crypto, uh, but but specializing especially in smart contracts. And then uh, Khalil, and Khalil was you know someone I actually knew growing up, childhood friend, but also he had helped even in the early days building out that initial demo with the grant funding. He had, you know, I, he was one of the people I paid almost as a contractor. And he also like lent plenty of his own time to it and helped develop, he helped, you know, work with me to develop that initial UI that we launched with, um, and, and was there at the day of launch. And so those are like the first two hires is, you know, full, full stack engineer who specializes in smart contracts and, uh, designer, you know, design, in, insanely talented designer who also had some like front end development shops as well and would, would contribute to code base directly. And that was like the, the team for maybe the first four or five months. Uh, that we added Ian was, you know, went with like full-time front-end devs. And then that was like for the next year, that was basically like the, the there was, there was, um, you know, people who helped out a little bit as, as advisors and, and Ash helped out and, 
but and, and Moody joined uh, a little bit later, but uh, that was like that sort of initial crew um, in, in that, you know, you know, building like from going from Uniswap V1 to Uniswap V2, it was basically like me, Cal, Ian, and Noah. Cool. Yeah. So I, I, I think one of the things that's notable about Uniswap's sort of origin story is that is that UI that you shipped on top of the protocol, the, the yeah. first sort of product on top, which was really beautiful, really simple. You know, not, you know, to this day, not much has changed in, in the like core UI. And I'm, I'm sort of being intentionally reductive. Of course, a lot has changed, but the core of it is, um, is, is kind of the same, which is to me a signal that it was, um, it, it was sort of the right, um, design, the right product for the, for the job. And, um, so that's a theme that we're, we're going to sort of get into further in the course of the discussion is the, the, the role of product versus protocol and organizationally, how you, how you guys have tackled that as, as the project's grown. Um, to tee that up, I, I wanted to introduce this, um, this, this sort of, uh, concept, this business sort of theory, um, popularized or, or maybe even, um, sort of labeled by Joel Spolsky. So there's a great, great blog post on this topic of commoditizing the complement by Joel Spolsky. Um, and the, the core of this idea and something I've, I've written a lot about as well, um, is that, you know, in, in business, um, you are generally better off if you are able to commoditize your compliments. So by way of example, if you're in the business of selling cereal, you want milk to be utter, an utter commodity. You, in fact, want milk to be free um, because if milk is free and widely available, you'll, you'll sell more cereal. And another, another good example is like printers, right? If you sell printers, you want, you want ink to be incredibly cheap because if ink is incredibly cheap, um, presumably you'll sell, you'll sell more printers. Um, and so I, I think this, this kind of framework is interesting when, when applied to crypto, because I think one, one way to think about protocols and products is as complements to, to one another, you kind of, you, you need both, um, and, um, arguably you need, you need both to different degrees at different times and the trajectory of each, uh, product and protocol respectively. So, so I just want to sort of put that out there as, as a framework to a backdrop to our discussion, right? Commoditizing the complement is, is a, is a well-understood business theory and strategy. Um, and it, it may have a role to play in crypto. Um, and so, you know, I think again, one of the things you did early on with Uniswap is you, you built this protocol and then you built this really beautiful, really intuitive product on top and you ship both at the same time. And the product was given away for free. Um, I'm curious if you could just talk through the sort of in it, like the initial thinking, maybe it wasn't as sophisticated as, as I'm making out, which is probably the case, right? Maybe, maybe you did think about it, but what was the sort of initial thinking of doing both a product and protocol in the earliest days? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of different angles to it and I can, I'll just try to, you know, talk through as many as, as kind of immediately come to head, but, um, mm -hmm. could keep going. I think that, uh, definitely, you know, in this like initial proof of concept demo stage. It was just like practical. Like I needed to demo this, this software. I need to demo this protocol. So I need a, a UI to demo it with. And I think it's like that. It kind of like started out as just like part of like the process of demonstrating what this project was and what it could be. Um, I definitely think that like one of the things that I didn't like, like maybe I don't also have like that much of a trading background. Uh, like I obviously at this point understand, you know, trading market, but I, I think in the early days it was like somewhat newer to trading and the like user experience. Uh, for at the time, Ether Delta was like the, the main decentralized exchange. It just felt so cluttered and messy and complicated. And it maybe like felt like that was, it, it was hard to know what, what like, was it messy and, and, and complicated and bad UI because of the structure of an order book, right? Uh, or was it messy and complicated because it was like just a bad UI? And I think when, when working on Uniswap, right, part of the thing is, you know, in addition to like it being decentralized, it was also like slightly of a, a re look at how market structure worked. And so I think with that, it kind of naturally intuitively made sense to like experiment with different potential designs for how to interact with it. Um, so I think that partially was just like, as we're thinking about like AMMs and their place in the world, you know, uh, it was, there was also this like, well, how will people actually interact with them? And I think that that was like really, you know, I think that like, it was hard to know, it would be, it would have been hard for someone else to like work on that problem at the time because they didn't have necessarily the same level of like 
intuition and sophisticated intuition around AMM, right? Like you had, you kind of needed to know what an AMM was and how it worked and why it mattered to like build the liquidity provision UI and maybe not to build the swapping UI, but like the liquidity provision UI you needed. And so I think that there was like, it was just like an early thing that was like on my mind as I was working on Uniswap. I um, was definitely very fortunate to reconnect with Cal, who's just such a talented designer. Um, I think that I also personally like product development and product design uh, as much. You know, I like product development as well, but I, I kind of like them both personally. So I think that like maybe just part of the reason is just like I also enjoy it. Um, I'd say that like there was an element where like there was some precedent of like zero X was did exist at the time, and zero X was taking a completely opposite approach, where zero X was like. Um, they were like mainly marketing and developers. They said they weren't going to host and build their own UI. They were just going to rely on other people to build their UI, right? They, were, they had a few UIs, like Radar Relay. Um, I think for me, one reason that I like building at multiple layers of the stack is that if you don't, you sort of like don't, you have like, you start to like run into issues at one point where um, like you, you, you start to run, like there's like this, you don't really have, like, you, it, it's hard to think holistically while, like, like you, you just have to think about the abstraction layers that you're creating when you're, when you're creating products and protocols, right? Like, you could think of, like, the, the smart contract. Like, before we, we, today we have a backend team, but back then it was just front end and, and smart contracts, right? And the front end would directly into the smart contract. And so was, you, could have, you could think of Ethereum as, like, the back end component of, of the Uniswap system, and the UI is, like, the front end component. And it's, it's sort of, you know, it would be sort of like, you know, Definitely, there are companies that are solely developed, solely developed APIs, and there are companies that solely develop, you know, user-facing products and consume other people's APIs. Um, but I think, especially just because of the like nature of like crypto and 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 AMMs, where they're like people are still trying to figure out how people are going to use these things, and it's very easy to like be like, oh, that's not my problem. Let me just like think in this constrained box. But if you're doing that, you're sort of risking that like other people like. It's very easy to be like, yeah, oh, other people will figure out how to make a good UI on top of this protocol I'm developing. Um, but what if like the UI the protocol you're developing like isn't the right thing to build a good UI on top of? Or what if like building the right UI on top of it requires the protocol level expertise needed? Um, so like I think that like today, right, it's easy, like there are other UIs and other UIs have gotten better. But at the time of the initial development, uh, due to like the novel nature, I don't think anyone else could have built built. Um, uh, maybe the other thing I'll say is that like the the philosophy going into the protocol like to the product um, was just like making it easy and simple to use. I think that like crypto is already like complicated enough. Like there's a lot of like mental models people need to learn. People need to learn like new interaction patterns. People need to learn how to manage their private key. Like there's already a lot of things people have to learn. And I think that like sort of, I think this is just like a general philosophy we have at Unisub Labs. It's like making things as simple as humanly possible. Like almost at any, at every front, like, you know, starting from protocol development to like, you know, developer experience it, when possible to to um, the, the products people are using. Just like the easier it is to to, to use something and interact with it, the better. Um, and crypto just kind of suffers from like people not being very sensitive to users' needs. And so I think that like having a user facing component to our, what we do just makes us like that much more like kind of able to to uh, more directly solve user problems. And and uh, something that we've um, only just started to like like. Something and it started to like bear very interesting like results in like now that we have like a mobile we have like a mobile wallet now and we have like a smart contract team and we have a backend team and we have a front end we have all these different and they're starting to like kind of um, like there are like things that we can build at a smart contract and protocol level that like make our like wallet better and there are things that we build and and the things that we learn about what hurts our users in our wallet level is like informs like the smart contracts we develop and so I think that like. There's this like really nice, um, people just like don't know, like it's just, it's so hard to get into crypto and use it. And so I think that having that like, uh, that depth and breadth is like been pretty helpful at labs, but it, it can be hard to pull off and there's, there's downsides to it as well. Yeah. I, I think the, you know, the, the, the main sort of thing that I think is so special about this story and labs today is you know, in, in what you're saying, essentially, it's like you were the first consumer of the protocol as the application on top. And then yeah. in building the application, you, you were anticipating sort of your user needs and, and that in turn informed the actual, you know, design of the protocol. And, and that's just a really nice flywheel where if, if you take a sort of user centric view and, and start from yeah. the endpoint, which is what like problem does this protocol solve for a user? 
you and and try to design for solving that problem in a UI on top, you very quickly get you know great insights about yeah. whether or not you are in fact solving that problem in the best way possible. And yeah. you know you can evolve both the the product and the protocol um, respectively to, to 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 try to solve that problem. And and I think that's very key to to the earliest success of, of Uniswap. And I think it's also something that I've sort of you know watched you. Uh, sort of imbued to the organization, the project as a whole, as it's as it's sort of gone on to multiple upgrades and multiple new product lines. Um, yeah. And so, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, just yeah, not to, that, like that. And like, it's also just like it's very easy to like be like not my problem. Like you know, the UI layer will figure it out. But I think that like we're just not a team and project that like likes to kind of like hand waves like the like the problems that hold us back the most. Like that's why we got into like the wallet game as opposed to just staying at the web app level. It's like the, like the vast majority, like we, we created the support team for our web app, you know, to make sure that people who are having issues had someone who could, they, they, you know, have people they could reach out to. And the vast majority of our support tickets were like, you know, related to bad wallet UX. And, you know, we couldn't do anything about that other than like, you know, go to wallet teams and be like, Hey, can you improve your products? And the, again, the wallet, the, the whole ecosystem is, is really great, but like getting into the wallet space has allowed us to like, really like, 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 it's just like, um, yeah, again, it's like, being your own first user, but also like kind of uh, just like making sure that you're solving your biggest problems. Because like you could like we can have the most efficient protocol, but our most efficient protocol isn't you know going to do anything if, if no one can use it and there's no good like UI. And so like even like having like our web like our web app doesn't need to be the only one, but having an example of a good web app is important to for other people to learn from. That like you know you're you're because yeah uh, anyway, but. Yeah, and I think it's it's also important to call out while you guys have gone sort of vertically up the stack and and built closer and closer to the end user, it's it's still the case today that like the vast majority of volume going through the Uniswap protocol is actually coming from third party um, applications, right? So there is this ecosystem of third party applications that have integrated the protocol, and and so I think it's important to call that out, especially yep. you know right here as we're talking about Uniswap going vertical, because. You know, I think an important question is, well, how did how did you get this like ecosystem of third party applications to integrate while also sort of building your own first party? Um, so, so again, I think this begs the question of like, what is the relationship between product yeah. and protocol, especially at the earliest stages when you know when, yeah. when you're bootstrapping? Yeah, for for what's worth, and like a lot of the UI, the alternate UI of Uniswap are essentially using fork versions of the, of the the initial UI that we created, and so like I think that like even speaks to like having that initial UI was actually very helpful to helping the, t- the, the broader ecosystem take off. In terms of like Uniswap growth, the ecosystem growth generally, like I will say like, it's not like we spent money on marketing, right? It was like a lot of very natural organic growth that happened um, it, since the very, early, very earliest days. And, and that happened at, like, at the user level with like, you know, to- like there was like, you know, the earliest projects were like, you know, tokens like MKR and, 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 and Spank, a like, few tokens that were like having, that like didn't have other good exchanges. And, um, it, when it came to like, I think one of the reasons that like this, this developer ecosystem started forming is just like, at, at, I think it was a combination of things, but really like it's, it's a protocol that's useful in it for a lot of different projects in a lot of different ways. And so now, and, and I think that like the, the amount of tokens and the amount of projects that were like on, on the platform just started growing so much around the protocol that really like people needed, needed tools and they didn't all exist, right? Like we didn't have the ability to build like everything at once, right? It was a very small, uh, it was, you know, like two or three people and we were building the second version of the protocol and didn't have, and so like Uniswap.info, right? Right. This sort of like info analytics site, which is maybe a little slow at this point and then needs some work. But um, the very first version of it was built by like a community member. It just like, they wanted to add a Linux to the project as they built it. So I think having like this, like the, just like the nature of the, I think that like something that's like really key here is that people are very like, hesitant to build on top of like closed ecosystems. Like, you know, like if you build on Twitter and then Twitter, I actually, maybe the better, the one of the day is Reddit, right? Like if you're, if you're building a, like an alternate UI to Reddit and then they rug their API, then like your whole project is dead. And I think that's what's so cool about Uniswap and uh, DeFi more broadly and Ethereum more broadly is that like other people can build on top of Uniswap and compete with labs and not, you know, they can build alternate UI, they can build alternate products and they don't have any risk that us as the creators of the protocol will just like, you know, kick them off. And so there's like this like ability to compete. And, and I think that that's been like really key. And so I think that like people felt safe building you know, their projects on top of Uniswap, you know, all the aggregators, 
all of the all the uh, all, you know other UIs, uh, wallets, etc. That you know started integrating other protocols, right? They don't have to worry about like counterparty risk, right? Which is which is one of like the key benefits of DeFi. Um, so I think that that's like one one interesting side of it. Um, yeah, and I, I would maybe posit one one other thing that I think is is critical, and and again, it's sort of a path dependent um, sort of sequence of events that 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 Uniswap sort of uniquely execute against, which is you build the protocol, you build this first UI on top. As you said, the, the UI made it really easy for both you know users on on sort of the t- you know demand side of the market and on the supply side of the market to interact with the protocol. And the result was you, you got some initial traction, like an initial liquidity. And in the case of Uniswap, that liquidity begets sort of a network effect of, you know, the more liquidity, the better the product gets for, for traders and so on. Um, and, and so I, th- I would go so far as to say, like, your initial product made the protocol a good place to trade, um, right? And that, in turn, brought third-party developers to the protocol because it, it was a good thing to integrate rather than sort of bootstrapping from scratch. So I, I think that that sort of sequence of ship, ship the protocol, ship the first product, bootstrap liquidity, and hopefully there's a net, some kind of network effect there that begets third-party development that compounds the, the protocol network effect. That's, a, I think, a very um, sort of you know, cogent strategy that, that hopefully is repeatable by, by other projects as well. Yeah, that, that, that is, I think that's all very well said. And I'd say that like one very key part of that, that order of operations is like, I think that shipping the product also like helps you know if your protocol is useful and people actually want to use it. I think that it's like, just there's like, and I think that sometimes even like the incentives of like the ways that people try to bootstrap liquidity can hide it. Um, but th- there's like a, I think incentives and, and even like the liquidity mining scene, all that stuff is like interesting and useful generally. But like, I think that like just very key steps of that process are like making sure that there, that products on top of this pro- protocol that you're building and you're building a protocol have like some level of demand and, and interest and usefulness to some group of people, uh, especially before you incentivize it. Otherwise, you don't really know if it's useful, and you can. And and once you know it's useful, then like, yeah, by all means, like start competing and incentivizing. But um, I think that like where some projects in the space sometimes go wrong is just like not really getting like tr- level like a true level of product market fit before like launching a token and, and going going all out on token incentives, and then then like it might work for a period of time, but then how long is it going to work for? It, it you know will yep. it really like stand at the test of time. Yeah, my my sort of writing on progressive decentralization, I think, was largely informed by the, the sort of path you just described, which is you know build build a product, build a protocol, build a product that people want, um, make sure it has some kind of product market fit, and then start to think about community ownership and and sort of effectuating that over time. Um, okay, so V four was just announced uh, about ten days ago, I think. Um, you, you've we, we've touched on um, you know how you've taken a user-centric approach to designing both protocols and products. Um, would love t- to hear you talk a little bit about the thinking in V4 through that lens. Like, what does V4 enable for, you know, for, for users, whether those users are traders or developers or market makers? Um, and anything you want to share around, you know, what Labs is working on on the product side, um, specifically as it relates to V4 or more probably. Yeah. Um, let's see where to start. So I'd say that, like, I guess I'll just start with V4 and what it is and um, to a quick overview. Uh, but basically, you know, Uniswap, I'd say that, like, I'm going to assume people know Uniswap v- V2, V3. Um, V2, super simple, AMM, V3, and this concentrated liquidity thing, but we'll, we'll just pretend everyone knows that if that works. Um, and then yeah. uh, I'd say that, like, Uniswap V4, I, the, the process of building an AMM is, like, a process of much... Uh, Trade, uh, much debate over trade-offs and uh, much, much, much bike shedding. And it's essentially that like every decision you make in the process of building your protocol, your AMM, uh, is like a trade-off between different, like, like, they're like the canonical, like easy example that we use, like the Oracle. The Oracle was such an interesting feature for V2 and V3. They provided like this like public good for the entire space, which is like other projects could, other pro- on-chain protocols could integrate on-chain price feeds that like had some level of robustness. Uh, and, and decentralization, uh, if, so, if there was enough liquidity in the pools. And it wasn't perfect, but it was like very useful for a lot of other projects. And the theory was that like that would ultimately, uh, you know, create greater liquidity in the platform and in the, and in the protocol because 
people would, you know, build co- integration to using the Oracle. They, they want the Oracle to have a lot of liquidity and be powerful. So they'd, you know, recommend it as a place for trading or they deposit their own liquidity. Um, so there was sort of like this network effect aspect to the Oracles. However, there was a downside to the Oracles, which is that the swappers had to pay gap costs uh, to, to maintain them. It, it, it amounts to like something like, you know, somewhere like, between like, 50, like something like 15% of gap costs of swaps is like updating the Oracles. And, you know, is that worth it? Um, very, very unclear, right? Um, you know, it, it's probably like, maybe it's worth it on certain pools where like the Oracles are like used a huge amount and they've created a huge amount of liquidity. Um, but really, again, only for swaps where like, like that additional liquidity is worth the additional gas cost. And it's like, there's like this always, it's like trade-off space. Uh, and then there's like other, you know, another thing that like um, came up with like, just generally, like anytime you want to add a new feature, it adds more gas costs uh, or it adds more code complexity. And this was just like constant wall we kept hitting. We had a lot of sure. ideas for where we could take AMMs, how we could experiment with them, what we could build on top of them. And every single time we'd run into this like complexity trade-off space. And it was almost never worth it to, it's never worth it to build an entire AMM to experiment with one AMM feature. Um, and so we had ideas for, for what we could do with these four, but the mo- most annoying thing is every single time it was like, well, is that worth it or not? And uh, you know, another example is like the fees, like dynamic, like, and so like with Uniswap V4, we, we built this, this, you know, plugin slash module system that we call hooks, which really lets people modify certain aspects of pools, uh, in, in pretty expressive ways that allow you to like really customize and, and add on features or modify parameters of the, of the pools in, in mean, very meaningful ways that allow you to experiment with, with AMM design, with pool design, with like new types of integrations and, and products on top of it. But in way, but but without having to like rebuild a name run from scratch each time, and in a way that like uh, I'd say that the other kind of uh, component here is just like in the more liquidity gets fragmented across pools, there's like this cost of aggregating it. Right? If you're like in a per- in a world with no gap, then no, then none of this matters. But let's say there's no no gap, like then you there's well it doesn't matter. It doesn't it matters a lot less, right? Because you could just like perfectly just split your trades across all as many pools as you can. And it's like efficiently aggregating them and you can benefit from the liquidity in like an aggregated set of liquidity and in, in like a, in like a, the, the problem with, um, with that though, is that like, there is actually a, it's very specific cost to each additional liquidity pool that you're using liquidity from for a specific trade. And so the, the kind of other main benefit of, of Uniswap V4 is this like pooled singleton model where all liquidity pools live in a single contract. And that reduces the gas cost overhead to um, to liquidity fragmentation. It doesn't completely remove it. Like there's still a cost to it, but we're moving to a world where there can be a little more experiments happening. Um, and there's like a reduced cost of aggregating them. And the last kind of thing I'll say on that, and I, I should come back to the initial thing about, but um, uh, last thing there is just that um, there is already fragmentation happening because so much innovate because people can't easily like modify how Uniswap works um, at a protocol level. This experimentation is already happening. It's just happening external to Uniswap. And so right. part of what Uniswap V4 is about is not just like more experimentation within Uniswap, but taking an experimentation that happens today external to Uniswap and bringing that into the, Unis- the Uniswap ecosystem and having it happen within Uniswap. Um, so, and then the, the actual cost of like aggregating Uniswap with one of these other custom AMMs is actually lower than the cost if it's built externally because of the shared yeah. uh, singleton model. Um, so there's, it's sort of moving the, the protocol more towards being like a full developer, like AMM development platform. Um, you did ask about yeah. the relation to products. Well, so, and yeah, yeah. Let, um, let's come back to that in a second, but I just, I want to sort of, um, riff on, on what you just said. So the, the earlier today, I was giving a talk at, um, Venkat Rao's, uh, summer protocols fellowship, but which is being hosted by the Ethereum foundation. And I was talking about another framework, um, which is, um, Com- protocols that are that seek to be complete versus protocols that seek to be incomplete. And I, I first wrote about this in like 2019, and I used Uniswap V1 as an example of a protocol that sought to be totally complete. So th- those familiar is like X times Y equals K. That was the formula, and like that that was the AMM design, right? And it worked really well. You couldn't change it. No governance, right? Like just a just a, a totally specified protocol. And of course, in in you know. With the benefit of hindsight, we can now see that 
while that initial design was you know, trying to be complete and, and fully specified, it was incomplete in the sense that the world evolves around it and you've shipped since V2, V3, and, and now V4. And I think like one of the key lessons in what you just described about V4 is you're, you, you still maintain this like drive for the protocol itself to be complete. Like the governance is not taking on some outsized role in the protocol in V4. It's still a minimal governance surface area. The, 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 the protocol itself is fully specified. However, this specification leaves room for third parties to experiment and sort of, you know, evolve the, 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 the protocol and for the market to decide. Um, on on sort of what the most exciting or interesting evolutions are. And I think that's a really powerful um, sort of design principle that I, that I was, again, giving as an example today of combining like the, this property of completeness, trying to specify the important things in a protocol and make them kind of difficult to change while also allowing for surprise and, and sort of innovation that... Um, what, what I would class other projects as that are more incomplete, typically through governance, um, try to experiment, like foster experimentation and dynamism through um, that kind of more subjective or human decision making. This is a best of both worlds, letting the market decide on the modular components that are most interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On that, I'd say that like I wouldn't start, like I'm glad we started with like a more contained scope, simple project. Uh, I definitely think that like if I had tried to build before in 2018, 2017, it would be like insane. It wouldn't like, um, I think it like, it made sense. Like it was like ultra simple. Like, each version got more complex and like we learned a lot from each one. Mm -hmm. And so I think that like, but yeah, yeah, like totally agree. Like I think that like part of V4 is also just like, an acknowledgement that like there is no single best AMM design, there's no single best market structure. And that there is a complex trade-off space and that like not exposing it just means that you're like leaving room for like all that experimentation to have to happen outside of, of the ecosystem. And so it was sort of like a requirement to keep like continued innovation, uh, to keep Uniswap at like the forefront of, of yep. innovation in the space. It's just like opening up the, the, the world, for, opening up room for, for experimentation and um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want to make sure we, we have ample time because there's a lot of questions in the chat and people sending questions before. So let's kind of speed run this stuff, so the, the, the remaining stuff here. Yeah. So what, one, one thing we haven't touched on is, um, well, maybe to, just to wrap up on, on like protocol versus product, you, you got, you mentioned the wallet, like what, what's sort of the purview, like what, what, what is lab is building around the protocol today? And, and that's a segue to another question, which is organizationally, how are you doing that within labs? What does the org look like to support protocol and product development respectively? Okay, I'm, I'm bad at speed running, but I'll try. Um, I'd say that, you know, generally speaking, we have, uh, I'd say that like we have, you know, the, the main product that we have today. So we have obviously the smart contract protocol. We have, um, you know, a bunch of peripheral smart contracts that we've, we've experimented, we've developed. We have like developer tools that we've built, but kind of like the main things are like smart, like the way that the that labs is even organized. We have like front, a front end team, which is currently divided into you know, like the web app and the, the wallet. And the, you know, the web app uh, is, is like the most used app, right? We have like millions of users, millions of monthly users. And, you know, it's really a, a focused, focused experience around like swapping between tokens uh, or, you know, providing liquidity to pairs. And we start to add on new features and functionality like the NFTs and, and, and other stuff. Um, but, but, most, but it's really like, you know, a place people can go to, to really buy and sell, you know, all, all, all the ERC-20 tokens. Um, not, not all of them, but, but many, um, then, uh, you know, the, um, I'd say that the wallet again came out of this, like, as we were thinking about like, how do we improve the, the core, like the, the funny thing with Uniswap is that like, it was sort of like a lot of people, you know, cut like Uniswap is their first destination in, in DeFi or in crypto or, or in self custody. It might not be their first, like usually the first destination in crypto is something like Coinbase or Binance, you know, buying ETH or buying Bitcoin. And then from there, you want to buy something like, you know, some, some ERC-20 token. Uh, you know, usually at that point, you're like, oh, what is like, you start to learn about Uniswap. And then you go to the Uniswap web app. And it, what used to happen, the experience of landing on the Uniswap web app used to be like, oh, okay, now you can go to Coinbase to, you, you, oh, you land on Uniswap, go to Coinbase, buy some crypto, go download this Chrome extension called MetaMask, send your crypto from Coinbase to MetaMask, and then connect your MetaMask to Uniswap. And that was like an insane journey. For users to start, we wanted like a place where you could be like, oh no, you just like download Uniswap, 
you're, you can get started from scratch, right? They had this, yeah. So we, we now we have this mobile wallet. Um, so the, the combination of like this, like user journey, like people want came for Uniswap and we like pushed them out to like a bunch of disparate user experiences. And, uh, some people still want that. We still support third party wallets, of course, and we always will, but you know, having like, oh, you came for Uniswap. Here's, here's how you get started with Uniswap, download the Uniswap wallet. And then, oh, and then like, oh, you want to buy crypto? There's a fiat ramp built in. And so I think that like the, the, the sort of pieces start to come together. We, you know, Uniswap is like people like. Our web app was the first step in making people's journey. Actually, I'm not speed running. I'm terrible at speed running. I already told you that. Um, and then, uh, and then, uh, I'd say generally, like, well, I think something that's starting to happen at Labs is that you know our our wallet and our web app are kind of like coming closer together. Like, you know, some of the recent updates and features to the web app are actually just like views that we had in our wallet that we pulled out into the web app. Right? There's like this new like portfolio view uh, you can click on and you click on your account. And that's basically just like the, the exact view you get when you open your wallet, um, but sort of coming up as a sidebar on the web app. And you know, the same way that like today, like Coinbase has like a Coinbase mobile and they have Coinbase web. I think over time they should like come closer together and they should feel like more like, oh, it's just Uniswap. Um, with like wallet having certain functionality that's a little different, web app having a certain functionality that's a little different, maybe more data, more, more data rich views, et cetera. But um, really like, we have this like core consumer like trading, you know, consumer like I want to buy and sell crypto um, uh, product, which is the web and mobile app. And then we have this this on chain smart contract protocol, which is meant to be like the best, you know, the best AMM. Uh, and it was before really almost like AMM platform. And then we have this like back end layer, which is just like how do we make our web app and mobile app like performant and have like up to date data. Right, the, you know, it used to be like we could just like have our front end connect directly to our smart contracts and have that be like performant because there wasn't that much happening. But there's like so much data, there's so many trades, there's so much, you know, so many tokens that uh, we you just need like this like API layer for for you know essentially for performance. Um, and it's it's about a hundred. How many people at, yes. at Labs today? Yeah, so yeah, Labs is about a hundred people. It's probably a little bit more than half engineers, maybe fifty five engineers, sixty engineers out of a hundred. Um, Generally, how does like, it break down? You know, how does it break down yeah. product versus protocol? Yeah, so you know the protocol. I mean, protocol engineering is, is actually a relatively small. Team. It's like eight nine people um, who are, who you know work on smart contracts. Which again, V one was just me. You know, V two was like me and Noah. V three was like me, Noah, Lodi. You know, so like the earliest version. There, you only you don't need like that many smart contract engineers. Um, uh, definitely now we have more and it's partially because we're working on more projects at once. We're updating our routers. We're updating, you know, smart, uh, the, the, we've obviously worked, we're working on V4. We have a few other fun stuff in the works on the smart contract side. Can't, can't, uh, nothing, nothing to, no news to break today. Um, but, um, the, the protocol, the engineering team is like relatively small and then we have like, um, maybe like 20 or so people on the, on the consumer facing products. Um, a little bit over 10 on like the back, like, uh, back end is like, you know, something like 10, but like we, we definitely generally speaking, like are heavily, very heavily oriented around a product and engineering and design. We have like very, very small teams for stuff like legal and communications and marketing and all of that stuff. You know, only just started to dip our toes in marketing for the first time with the mobile, mobile wallet. Um, mm -hmm. you know, historically to date, it's all just been, um, organic growth. And so. We're starting to experiment with like with other you know policy even but um uh, mostly just focused around yeah i think it's a, i think it's a, it's a, it's interesting the protocol team is is relatively small and like organizationally you know, so much more weight on on product i think that's a great place to park it um thank you very much for coming on i think this was like you know we could have gone for many hours and this, this app like was packed with tons of insight um a, a lot of stuff that i think is generalizable to the next generation of people building in the space um, so thank yeah, thanks for coming on and for, for being an inspiration to to us and you know to others who will view this in the recording. Yeah, thank you for for having me and and good luck to everyone and uh, yeah, great great talking. <laughs>